we have an um, exciting group of speakers to discuss rehearsing the museum and then the questions that the film opens up. Uh, I would like to, to make a brief introduction for our speakers. Um, to my right, we have Daniel Ho, editor and writer. Um, Daniel is also in charge of publications at Daikun. Um, next, we have Samson Wong, artist and academic who currently teaches at the um, Hong, Kong, um, Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. We have Marisha Lewandowska, an artist based in London. Uh, Marisha actually lived in Hong Kong for about three years, right? Wherein she taught at the, the Chinese University of Hong Kong and when she did a residency with Asia Art Archive. And last but not least, we have Yang Yang, um, who's an independent curator and writer, um, founder and artistic director of Sound Pocket, one of the most exciting not for profits in Hong Kong, I should say, who also teaches at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, so we are, they are, we are very excited about this panel for several reasons. And first of all, I want to say that Marisha is an artist who works on the public functions of archives, exhibitions, and institutions. So her practice is very um, close to our heart at Asia Art Archive, where we um, do research, where we do archiving and programming around recent art in Asia. So we create resources, but we also try to, to put equal emphasis on how we make these resources available for research and for public use. But having said that, we also know that publicness doesn't really only depends on access, um, but it's at the end of today, it's about the users themselves. It's about the, the sense of engagement, sense of ownership that they have or they might not have, and um, also their engagement with these institutions. So these are these questions, these issues are quite key for um, Marisha's practice. Um, I should also add that personally, I met Marisha around 10 years ago. Um, so she's been quite influential for me on the way that I try to, to formulate these questions around uh, different types of form, that different forms of ownership and custodianship for art um, and for culture. And um, another thing that I learned from her is the way that she forms these communities around the research questions that she has. Um, so if you look at her practice, creating these groups or creating these communities is as important as creating artworks eventually. Um, I guess today is a great example of that because all the speakers that we have in front of you, they've been following Marisha's research for a number of years and they've been exchanging ideas around institutions, around museums, among each other for a while as well. Um, so I'm very happy that you all agreed that we continue this conversation today in front of an audience as well. So um, to start the conversation, I asked each of, our, each of the speakers to, to think about a very particular scene or a particular aspect of the film um, and use it as a provocation. And I hope that uh, when we start with this, we'll start hearing about your own urgencies in this larger conversation, and then we'll have um, a conversation after that as well. So we'll switch to a more conversational mode. But I would like to start with Samsung, please. Uh, I'll just say a few words about uh, what intrigues me most when I uh, watch the film. And uh, this is actually my third time viewing it. And um, I would make two points. First of all, I'm most intrigued by uh, the use of space in the film. That is also uh, my research interest in how uh, fictional films and also documentaries um, use space to narrate, um, to, to form a narrative. And I'm really interested in how some of the rooms and uh, particularly modernist structures and pavilions are shown in the film, especially those in, um, in the abandoned uh, amusement park, which is, uh, looks like some kind of uh, very futurist structure. And those are colorful, Pavilions that I enjoy seeing a lot. It also connects to uh, not only my recent interest, but a lot of people get to be more and more interested in some of these uh, high modernist uh, 
uh, structures in, in recent years. So when I look at uh, some of the museum being portrayed, they are also built in a kind of aesthetics that uh, echoes to some of the uh, brutalist and utopian architecture we see. So um, I'm very interested in those kind of imagery, how uh, how the ruins uh, of the of the past, especially uh, the brutalist architecture, and how our contemporary museums are also uh, using those kind of uh, aesthetics when they think about space. So um, this is the first uh, impression I have of the film, uh, how spaces are being portrayed. And secondly, um, if I have to choose uh, one of the scenes that uh, I like most, it, uh, it is the scene, uh, it's, a, it's an obvious choice actually, it's the scene uh, when uh, the, uh, uh, there are teenagers uh, skateboarding outside uh, the museum while the museum owner I suppose that is the that that portrays the museum uh, of that uh, protagonist who is speaking um, so I'm really interested in that scene in many ways uh, when the museum owner talks about architecture it all co it also uh, talks to my first point about how uh, museum are imagined to be spaces of for the future, and uh, a lot of uh, the symbolic capital we talk about, uh, we see people talking about in the film, also involves uh, star, uh, star architects and uh, iconic architecture in recent years. Uh, so I I really like how he mentioned uh, Bilbao and uh, how he get get to learn about this kind of culture through architecture and. Um, but uh, within this layer of uh, meaning or how he like to position himself as an investor and also a developer, which is uh, opposite to uh, a lot of tendency we see today, people who avoid positioning themselves as developer or, or uh, investor, but rather want to be understood as mainly collectors or uh, museum owners. So uh, another layer I'm interested in is uh, echoes to the banner we see behind when he's speaking. There are some banners with uh, 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 yellow in color and red red uh, fonts on it, uh, which is the uh, ubiquitous uh, all the, the kind of slogan we see everywhere in 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 China in Chinese cities that uh, that are about a particular kind of ideology, but uh, they are not they are never really. Uh, uh, taken seriously, so to speak, by the citizens. So it, it, it is. It, uh, I find it interesting that uh, how the museum owner is uh, uh, narrating a particular type of belief, that uh, which is kind of like how those slogan operates in, in the cities as a whole. So um, I guess this is uh, what I uh, what my provocation is. Thank you. Daniel? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so I guess it really, you know, context really makes a difference. Um, I guess before I watched this film, I was looking back at a previous work uh, by Marisa about the Future Museum. So actually, I was conditioned to think about an exemplar. And so that's why when you asked me for a specific scene, I was actually thinking of an emblem, something emblematic of a, of, 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 of a possible future museum or something that um, Marisa was gesturing at. Now, I'm, 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 I take notes on my cell phone, so I'm not looking at um, social media or anything. Uh, so... <laughs> What I, ch I actually thought a little bit more about the, the garden, right? Because basically at a certain key point uh, you mention, or, or the narrator rather, mentions that in the context of modeling a new museum paradigm, we might want to revise the rhetoric and public perception of global museums and see them more as more like global gardens of curiosity. Of course, the two are conjoined. I mean, then I thought a little bit about like some of the vegetation, you know. I mean, I think there, uh, for me, I, I just took it as an emblem and took it also as a model. For one, uh, is to contrast some of the, you know, you, you see some of the gardening and the major architecture kind of buildings, a little bit empty, a little bit nothing. And then there's a certain point where it switches to, uh, well, let's not say the specific museum, but 
uh, a museum where it's very enclosed, almost like a Chinese traditional Chinese garden in a way. So from, for me, it, I'm just really using that to <laughs> uh, think about a few things. One is kind of the shift, historic shift from royal, imperial, you know, gardens and museums to a public sphere. How this ambivalence of something private, something personal in either in a royal manner or in a private museum can be contested and challenged and over time uh, become somewhat public, but all the ambivalences that come with it. Two, uh, maybe, the, maybe when we say garden, you know, there's a, a, a presumption of something bourgeois, some, of a, something class-based, and yet you know, the garden offers opportunities maybe to rethink uh, a museum in, in the sense that I'm thinking of like, some of the problematics that people are talking about White Cube. I mean, Brian O'Doherty has, has, has talked about in terms of formal aesthetics that a certain White Cube in isolating art from a, a formalist, unreflected aesthetics that isolate art from a, a, a surrounding, and how maybe a garden, can, just a metaphor, an emblem of the garden, can offer a way out. But we don't know how, what it looks like, and maybe it doesn't lead to a way out. Maybe it leads to you know shopping malls and theme parks, and you know a commercialized, consumerized kind of version, right? So I, I, I think maybe I was just conditioned to think about how Marisha was offering uh, different uh, ideas about uh, a future possible museum that is perhaps more interesting, more just, but with all the ambivalences that come with it. It's perfect that I'm following Daniel's provocation, and this is from me. Thank you, Marisha, for the film. After the curtain, there's the sky. I'm not saying the curtain opens to the sky. I'm saying, after the curtain, there is the sky. What is the interval between the curtain and the sky? How long is it? What is in it? What is suspended in it? Is there an interval? The interval, which is intermediary between the boundaries, appears to be something insofar as it is independent of the displaced body. Luce et rigore in Ethics of Sexual Difference. The edge of a building, cables crisscrossing. The sky isn't cut up. Our view is, our eyesight does. How is the sky? Where is the sky? Then there is snow, a lot of snow. The camera works behind snow-capped trees. Is it hiding from something? Is it camouflaged? Is it searching and pausing for more searching? The gray continues onto the top of what is perhaps a museum building, as if touched by snow, exceedingly radiantly white. The building is not a receptacle, but a smooth surface on which our eyesight glides or slips past. A female voice says, local landscape, remote location, alien sensation. These are not mood shots. It's the weather. It's the physical world that makes every one of our day different. There is no inside, only the open air. The created, the liberated. The comings, the goings, rites of passage, constitutions, reconstitutions. Ice seen from above. If it ever melts, what would it reveal? The camera zooms out. A change of temperature. Fallen leaves in brown and green, stones and pebbles too, in pinkish and yellowish light. A tinge of springiness in the air. The camera slowly tilts up. Finally, a door, an interior. Where is the action? There or in the open air? In between conversations, a hand fondles a stone in 10 full seconds. A stone of the learned in the ancient Chinese tradition as a reminder of the infinity of nature and the limit of a human life. It's almost the end. A building stands in a sunlit plaza. The camera zooms out, the sky sets in. In the narrative is this line, quote, let artists co-produce the museum, end quote. 
Not everyone can read the image of a museum, but everyone can read the image of the sky. Anthropologist Tim Ingold, in engaging with ecological psychologist James Gibson's ideas, speaks of the sky. And I quote, stars, whatever their astronomical significance, are perceived not as objects, but as points of light. And sunsets, as the momentary glow of the sky, as the sun vanishes beneath the horizon. Nor are clouds objects. Each is rather an incoherent, vaporous tumescence that swells and is carried along in the currents of the medium. To observe the clouds is not to view the furniture of the sky, but to catch a fleeting glimpse of a sky in formation, never the same from one moment to the next. Indeed, in a world that is truly open, there are no objects as such." End quote. To bring the weather world into imagining the museum is to highlight flux and impermanence. In a little book from Documenta 13, Emily Jazir and Susan Buckmores write, quote, in view of the fleeting nature of truth, any attempt at permanence of historical interpretation leads to error. Our situation demands a new form of exegesis, one that rescues the legibility of the past against the conventions of official memory." End quote. I recall the recent fires at the Notre Dame and the National Museum at Rio de Janeiro. Are they perhaps timely challenges for us to reconstitute models of greatness and of heritage? Heritage as always already intangible, yet alive. The curtains are still closed. How can we find a distinctive sense of being alive with and not only in the museum? I have a footnote to make, Osgay, which is new and you haven't seen it. I'm going to do it anyway because of this big screen, um, it makes me think of the sound. Uh, the language that is exchanged between the two women, uh, self-consciously producing a discourse on the museum, which makes me ask, are they in tune? Are we in tune with them? And what other sound makes sense other than that which is vocal, accented, and mouthed into words, foreign words? That's it. Thank you, Ang. Uh, Marisha, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you the same question, um, but um, I want to ask you something else. I know that you didn't start your research about future museums in China and contemporary museums in China with a film in mind. Uh, and over time, you decided that you would like to, to fictionalize your research. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you made that decision. Hey, well, thank you very much for these responses. I really feel... Um, I will kind of impose my voice now onto these very poetic um, reflections and kind of bring you to the earth by uh, maybe talking about how and why the film was made. Um, and maybe we can return to the kind of poetry that you created uh, in your response, which is um, very, very helpful for me to, to hear. So I guess fiction is a uh, tool for me and for many artists, uh, especially when uh, dealing with, well, in, in my case, I work a lot with archives. And archives are those places where you both find uh, things, but also where a lot of things are missing. And uh, I think it's useful to introduce fiction uh, in those places where you detect that something is missing. So in that way, the fiction kind of contextualizes that which is missing. And for me, this way of contextualizing the missing or something that's been suppressed or erased, whether it's um, a voice of somebody or an event or um, women as um, representatives of 
kind of another kind uh, that very often never make it to to the archive. It's then for me a challenge to try and you know, rewrite history by using fiction. Uh, so it's like a augmenting that which maybe happened, but has never been, um, well, it's not present in the archive. So I think this way of, and the film that Daniel mentioned, the Museum Futures, which was made um, 10 years before this film, which was uh, imagining another museum, a Western museum, Moderna Musette, um, in 2058, was a, a perfect way of um, wishing something. So to use fiction for an artist is a way of wishing for that which is not yet. So that's how, <laughs> I guess, partly answers what you asked about fictionalizing uh, the research. The research is, is essential um, and it's also not just my research, it's, um, it's co-written with a um, Taiwanese, Beijing-based um, writer and curator, uh, Zian Chen, uh, whose knowledge and research really contributed greatly to my understanding uh, of the conditions, cultural conditions, social conditions, and, and these possibilities for the museum of the future. That idea of fiction and speculation is something that I would definitely would like to, to go back. But first of all, um, I think I would like to, to think more about your contributions and, and different types of vantage points that you all talked about. We spoke about the CCTV footage, we spoke about the gardens and, and the different types of natural landscapes. And um, also there are so many different vantage points in the film. I mean, off the top of my head, um, I can also think about the first moment that the film opens, you know, we are looking at the sky. Then the, the next scene, we see a drone footage. Um, the next scene, we are very close to the ground in the, the garden scene. And they are very different from each other. And for me, thinking about the, the concept of the film or the subject of the film as the museum, I was trying to, to think about what that means. And to me, for instance, it says something about um, distance and also something about different forms of engagement, maybe a hesitation, maybe willingness. I mean, something um, being closer to the ground or being really um, isolated and at a far out place. And I would like to ask all of you actually how you think about that former quality in the film, former language in the film and the more conceptual framework. How do you connect these two? Can we start with you, Rang? Yes, but it's, it's, it's such a big question. <laughs> but I have something to say, though. I thought it suddenly makes sense, Marisha, when you said, you know, it's about contextualizing what is missing. Because I feel, I mean, when Noske, you mentioned how um, the camera is very close to the ground, for me, it's a spreading of space. And the vastness and emptiness of the film, I think it's, it's very persistent, these qualities. And so, um, and also the sound as well, like, you don't, there is nothing, there is this almost deafening silence and then the intervention of the human voices and then of course there are other things but um, there to me is clearly a kind of, of um, juxtaposition uh, which is I think related to violence because Marisha you just mentioned suppression and my question would be we could always come back to that after hearing from you guys as well. I, I'm thinking uh, um, how um, how much violence do you think, Marisha, is involved in the making of a museum, of the f or or of the fictionalizing of the museum? Uh, do you want me to answer now? <laughs> uh, well, I I have something else to say about these um, the way of constructing the film. Um, most of it really happens in post-production. It's uh, a joy to be working with an incredible editor. So it's really thinking through editing. And um, this freedom that I think film gives you to 
use all kinds of footage. So the footage that is shot on your iPhone, the footage that shot with an amazing um, camera, the archival, the something that is stolen from uh, a CCTV. So all of these, in fact, I see this differently to what you described, which is um, very close to, ex to my experience of a museum, that you walk, I mean, an engaging museum offers all of these uh, sensations of being close, of being in the contemporary, of being in the history, of hearing people. So I constructed the film in a way that one could think of these different scenes as walking through the different uh, parts of a museum. So it also has a kind of, I would say, I think it's very interesting what you say about the weather, is that the weather is a very uh, democratizing force. It is something that affects us no matter where we are. And I think this interesting question that, that you ask about can, so when someone looks at the image of the sky, they know what that means. But when they look at the image of the museum, do they know what that means? Now, is it possible? I mean, it's something that I am um, maybe proposing that uh, while there is a difference, that maybe there is a possibility that looking, well, it's actually not just about the looking, but um, experiencing a museum of which you are co-producer makes it, it gives it more chance that you begin to recognize both yourself and your community and your ancestors and it is not such a strange place anymore. So, you know, by sort of constructing this idea of museum as commons, of knowledge commons, it's really asking, you know, how could one um, be engaged in making the museum rather than just visiting the museum? And it's, you know, it's a kind of dream uh, that is good to dream because the moment you dream, it's sort of, it's already happening. I, I, w I didn't say anything about the violence, but um, I think, yeah, violence uh, relates much more to something very, very personal. I would say that, you know, I grew up uh, in Poland and the communism and uh, for me, it was also a very, very big challenge and interest to interrogate that aspect of the Chinese contemporary uh, condition, which has these ideological um, patterns, which for me make absolutely no sense to my experience of communism where I grew up. So there's this junction between ownership, um, financial aspiration, and ideas that truly kind of belong to communism or commons are very, very troubling. And this is where I would probably situate the violence. Samson, I would like to turn to you uh, because in, our, um, in a previous conversation that we had, you were saying that the idea of co-producing or fe feeling able to co-produce a museum, it could be something utopian as well. So I want to go back to, to my question and ask your opinion about uh, different forms of engagement and then the different types of vantage points that we've been speaking about. Uh, speaking about uh, the weather and uh, also about space, I also realized that uh, people are using one of the museum's architecture as uh, uh, the shade it produces for their use uh, in uh, in strong uh, sunshine, under strong, strong sunshine, and also um, so uh, I guess uh, we have to think a lot about what kinds of engagement we are talking about when we talk about 
co-producing a space or a commons. Because even in um, in the literature of uh, human geography, there are a lot of uh, dialogue about uh, whether a, a commons actually need a physical space, whether the discussion about a common uh, overlap with the discussion about uh, a future form of public space. And I find it really interesting that a lot of concerns uh, in this discussion about uh, the possibility of producing a new kinds of commons in the 21st century, uh, a new kinds of uh, public space um, when a lot of uh, privately owned public space are being produced. And also uh, a lot of uh, museum are claiming to be community space. I think the dialogue are, are overlapping a lot about whether, what, what exactly is the kind of publicness we want. But uh, within the film, we see some kinds of very uh, casual and ordinary engagement could be, could be uh, very sweet as well, in a way. For example, uh, the people playing uh, uh, skateboarding uh, outside of a museum. And um, so I think there are multiple layers we would like to talk about, not just uh, in the very utopian sense of uh, creating a kind of uh, radical museology, how people uh, deal with the idea of nation or heritage or trauma together, but also about how to uh, share possibility of using space or uh, how to share different aspects of uh, everyday life together within this uh, space. So. Uh, I think it is important to distinguish these layers of discussion uh, and not just, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, these people should talk to each other as well, not just people who want to build museum, also people who want to build uh, commons uh, or, or public space together or even shopping malls. Actually back in the 1970s, there are a lot of discussions about shopping malls being new kinds of community space and providing new possibility of making community. But nowadays in most of the uh, uh, critical discourse, we would distance ourselves from shopping mall. So what about today when we see more and more shopping malls tr uh, claiming to be uh, community space and, and, and museums? So I think it is important to, uh, to, to to uh, put this into perspective uh, what, by just opposing these discussions. I don't know whether I'm responding to your question. And I actually, I, I was just, you know, now that you know, you're talking about that, you know, it's, it's really interesting. You, you mentioned earlier the skateboarding and people appropriating the space and using it in a different way. But then it also made me um, think of about, uh, and this is a question from Marisha, there were very few spectators looking at art, you know, I mean, and, and, and basically it was all like, well, either that narrator dialogue, either something in Bergen and, or something on the street. And then, you know, sometimes it seems almost the camera eye was enthralled by the museum architecture, but there was very little of that muse museum spectatorship of, well, supposedly viewing art. You know. uh, pretty deliberate, but what were you thinking? Well, yeah, to totally deliberate. Uh, well, mainly I think because it's um, speculative fiction and I'm not really speculating about art. Uh, I'm not really even thinking what will be inside those um, museums. I'm just thinking much more, and I guess, if I've become very sensitized to what conditions do we need to create for those exchanges to happen. So, you know, whatever shape it takes, um, I mean, whatever shape art takes, it actually doesn't interest me that much. Um, what interests me is, you know, who will want to talk to each other, um, how come that, you know, in, in a way, in, in your provocations, um, no one, none of you have mentioned uh, that these are two women 
and both of them have the aspiration of being museum directors. Um, one from the sort of development or property development perspective, the other uh, much more kind of idealistic, um, starting with uh, cooperative for single women. So, you know, th these are for me a much more important um, sites of um, projection of the, you know, possible museum or something that possibly, you know, the museum is no longer a term, a space um, that is relevant. Um, it maybe appears in, in quotation marks. Um, what, what is important is, you know, what are people going to, what, what is there to say to each other? So, you know, this speculation kind of allows um, for reflection. And for me, that is the, really the most important part of why it's worth making art. Um, it really doesn't matter uh, how it looks. It's important that it makes other people think about something. So, you know, that's um, the, the value of the film. So I guess that's why you don't see spectators. It's interesting that, Daniel, you mentioned um, the absence of the public uh, looking at art in the film, because I was also thinking about um, the, the curtain in the very beginning of the film, and then we also end the film with the, the same curtain. Um, and as a visual trope, I was thinking about what does it really say? And uh, to me, for instance, it reminds me of something that's constructed, that's fictionalized, or also about um, self-aware, image making, I should say. And um, I was also thinking about your own writing, for instance, and also editorial work and different viewpoints that you've been engaging people. So I'm thinking about how we can think about that visual trope and how do we interpret it vis-a-vis -vis our observations about people, friends or colleagues who actually try to speak about museums. What are the impasses? And, um, what are the, the binaries that we, get, that we get stuck in? Maybe we can start with you, Daniel. Yeah, Throwing I, the ball to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, sure. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, we're, we're moving a little bit away from, um, I guess, the, 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 the work specifically, but it still certainly revolves around it. Um, I think, yeah, no, I want to actually pick up a little bit more on what Marisha just said. Like, I think, well, I mean, in, in a way, the focus on the structure that, well, either presents art or uh, purports, claims to uh, present art, pr present a community, uh, an artistic community, or, you know, engage in a community. Uh, and I think, you, basically, you know, by focusing on structure, you're really denaturalizing it, it, trying to, you know, unpack it and make it, make us reflect on it. Uh, but I, I, I think ultimately it's like, you know, because a, a few of your works, as well as your work recently, think so much of the structure of it. Um, I, I just wonder, are, are, maybe are there particular moments where you make a much stronger, perhaps non-artistic stance? of speculation and you come out and make a critical statement? I, I mean, maybe I think you, you've taught before and so I just haven't been exposed to those situations. Uh, and then I, I just want to see like how speculation works vis-a-vis -vis something critical in that case, like a, a, a more direct critical, not that artistic engagement is not critical, I just mean a more direct maybe art historical, art critical engagement with something. How how would you like? You prefer definitely the speculative, fictional model, or do you also engage in a lot in a, in a more editorial, journalistic, art art critical kind of mode? Well, I I wouldn't generalize. Uh, it's um, I guess every project you know, calls for a different. Um, well, it it makes different demands upon me. 
and I make different de demands upon it. So um, maybe something like the, the publication, the undoing property, question um, mark. That's probably closer to um, offering a platform for critical thinking about ownership and inviting uh, a number of uh, artists and academics. And then I see my role as, well, putting it together editorially, together with um, Laura Potak, who I met at the same time as uh, Osge in Bart College. Uh, so, but I also very much uh, enjoy publishing as a platform. So, you know, publishing is the best for me way of creating a public. Uh, film maybe is kind of less successful. You really need to think of the circumstances of screening. Um, all my work is available, um, well, under Creative Commons online. So that's important critically. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that um, even though this is speculative work, it, it also kind of engages critique as a, as a driver. Can, can I just add to that? I, for me, I, I don't have a, I don't know actually what speculative fiction is, but I see in your film the, maybe the resistance of a positive first kind of attitude that, as you said, that you're not interested in, you know, putting things into the museum or, or even art per se. Um, it's not about uh, spectatorship or spectacles. And for me, it's um, about admitting a certain kind of vulnerability uh, when it is vast and empty. And yet, because of this liquidation, um, one is maybe regulating oneself against this claim of invincibility. Like, I, I won't be you know, um, defeated because I have all these things. But this is so not about that. And in, in a way, if there's a critical stance, Daniel, I think it's it's a very gently, though, um, and slowly um, unfolding itself rather than sort of uh, like putting a flag in front of us. That kind of gesture I appreciate a lot because it then opens up for us to think more. I just wanted to add something uh, since, you know, for me, this is also a kind of a celebration of my years um, or my my um, association with uh, Asia Art Archive. And I recall an occasion, uh, I think it was in conversation with Hamad Nasser, who was previously um, head of research, where I think, you know, I can't remember what question he asked me, but it's something that uh, stayed with me because I guess he provoked this question, this, this, this answer somehow. Um, that for me, the most important part of an artist's work is self-belief um, and not self-promotion. So I guess it's... Um, it's really important to, for me to make a work which comes out of an experience, however um, fragmented and inadequate in many ways, of uh, having lived in Hong Kong and uh, visited the region many times, uh, is to try and feel a sense of empowerment. So that's really, I guess what I try to offer is some kind of way of arriving at a critical point which originates from a self-belief in an idea that it is possible to construct something even though it will be highly inadequate. So that pooling together of everything you have and everything that you don't have where you just have to make up, whether it's money that you need to make the film, all kinds of other resources. I find it the most exciting part of being an artist is that 
there are always incredible limitations to everything that will be in front of you. And to make something given those limitations is really, I think, when people begin to appreciate and engage and respond. Because every one of us has to live through those limitations. Samson, I would like to, to ask the, the same question to you. I mean, you can choose um, to, to respond to that um, curtain as the, the visual trope and then how, you know, what it makes you think about and also maybe connecting it to, to that idea of speculation. How, in from, in from your perspective, what are the, the conversations, how are the conversations changing? I mean, have been, are we always very articulate about our own demands from museums? I mean, it's, uh, it's something that you deal a lot with in your practice as well. So I'm, I, wanna, I want you to, to tell us a little bit more about those demands as well. I mean, we can, we can speak about the, the curtain, as you were saying, or um, speculation as one of the tools that artists can use to, to articulate those demands. Because uh, you were saying previously that the, the way that we are articulating in demands in Hong Kong as well, it's been changing. It's not the same as people were speaking about museums five years ago. So um, actually, it, uh, the question came from some of our previous uh, conversation about whether people still speculate of what, uh, what kind of museum could appear in Hong Kong because there are discussions about people speculate a lot about possibility of the uh, various uh, cultural districts or, or institution could be. But it seems now people speculate much less. They just take for granted that some people will sort out what the city would have. Uh, it is some kind of discussion like this. So I'm really interested in what Mauritius said about um, uh, the previous uh, imaginations from artists we see, how they, uh, before any institutions uh, really make possible their plan, they can still enact something or, or to create something. Uh, for example, uh, uh, on West Kowloon, it has long been uh, just a piece of uh, wasteland for a long time. And the kind, if, if anyone is, has documented uh, how artists appropriate the space before any concrete plan, plan is implemented, that, that would be a very rich history of, of the land as well. So um, in that sense, I'm really interested in the word rehearsal and how central it is, um, the word is to, the, to this project. And, and this connect, also connects to the uh, curtain because it, it seems to be something about performance, performing, or about, about a show, but uh, uh, the formal one would not really begin, but uh, we always see uh, repeated rehearsal uh, all the time in Hong Kong these years that it seems everything uh, artists create are just rehearsals. So I'm interested in those kind of discussions and, and things and so on. So I wonder if uh, Mauricia would like to say a few things about the word rehearsal and how it connects to the whole project? Well, a rehearsal um, in this case has a, a number of um, meanings. One is um, directly related to the idea of the museum, how the museum as a construct is uh, not something that comes from Chinese culture. So. Uh, it's kind of adopted. So what the Chinese culture is doing is rehearsing the idea of the museum. So that's, I guess, one level. And I guess rehearsing that particular uh, formation in its um, kind of continuing modernizing project or it is, you know, the museum is so much part of a Western uh, modernity. So it's it's quite precise uh, in that sense. But the rehearsal is also related to um, how the film is constructed with the two women uh, who are, an am you know, they're both amateur actresses and they're unable 
to speak the lines because they also they are just unable. They um, cannot memorize. Um, those lines don't make sense to them. And when I was rehearsing with them in real, they said that that's not something that they could ever say, uh, which is not something you expect from an actress actually to believe in um, what they are um, saying. So there is um, this very, very overt awkwardness in which they speak. It's um, kind of artificial. Um, and I guess the, the, the rehearsing, in, it's the enhancement of, of it being strange um, and also difficult to place in any particular time. So maybe you're not sure whether it's already happened. Is it happening now or is it happening in the future? Are they recollecting? Or are they projecting? So I think this sort of confused temporality is, is, is a useful tool. And the last thing about the curtain. Um, the curtain is uh, from the museum in Bergen, uh, which is a museum of applied arts. And I think that whole story, I, and I really don't know if you, if you got it, because I, it's a sort of quite difficult story to, to tell. but it presented itself to me only because I was um, able to raise the funding from the uh, Arts Council in Norway. So they funded the film and as a kind of gesture towards them, they, they asked if I could include some Norwegian aspect in the film. <laughs> so I was very, you know, unsure how can I speak about the Chinese museums while at the same time satisfying the, the Norwegian story? Um, but when I went to Bergen, this amazing story just presented itself uh, of a museum that has the biggest Chinese collection in Scandinavia that was indeed uh, a very sort of emblematic collection of someone who was living in Beijing at the beginning of the 20th century and who really wanted to make money but failed. So then gave the collection to the museum. And then what you see the CCTV is, uh, is true that they have been burgled twice within one year. So they closed down the Chinese collection because they were so traumatized. And then suddenly this um, property developer appeared and recognized the columns from the Summer Palace and offered this exchange. Uh, and to this day, this has not been completed. So the museum is truly haunted by this gift, the original gift from General Munte. Then uh, this idea that somehow these columns can be repatriated to Beijing. And that deal was signed in exchange for money, which, uh, and the money was going to refurbish the Chinese galleries. But the developer has disappeared. And this has never been completed. So the money is in the bank, the columns are in storage, the Chinese gallery is still closed, and that curtain that you see in the film is in fact um, a curtain that the museum produced. It's the facade of the museum itself, and they use this curtain um, in public spaces uh, across the museum uh, to, I guess, remind themselves uh, where you are. So I think it's a kind of an interesting addition to you know, my speculation about what happens inside, how, you know, what is the facade of the museum, what it tells us about its history, about its origin, um, and the fact that you need a curtain for a performance, which essentially is what the film is. Daniel, would you like to respond to that or shall we open up to the floor? 
Okay, sure. Um, sure, sure, sure. So, uh, while this film is uh, completed, uh, there are ongoing activism in the Museum of, of the West challenging um, uh, how museum is being run and the whole movement about decolonizing the museum yeah. happening. So I find this coincidence also very interesting. And that also respond to uh, Oscar's question about um, how co-producing a museum could possibly play the process. So, uh, and I think one of the tendencies we see is people directly reclaiming the space in the museum. So I wonder that kind of modernization or learning from the West would ever happen in the Chinese context or the, or the, or the Hong Kong context. I think that's a, also a very interesting speculation because we sometimes see this kind of learning uh, from the uh, uh, museums in, uh, in Asia as well. So I, this is just mm. some more uh, to add. Maybe it's a good moment to have some comments or questions from our audience. Hello. Thank you, Marisha, for the beautiful film. And I think um, <clears throat> Here to screen this in Hong Kong, and and we can easily sense this special moment when we started to hear the Cantonese narration, and I could associate with your experience in Hong Kong, and also, and in the script is mentioned to Guangzhou, so Cantonese would be reasonable, but I just curious, like if you have any particular intention to make use of the Cantonese in the narration. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I think it, it signals alterity. It signals that China is not a place which only has la one language and one ethnicity, if you like. So that's one part of it. Um, the other part is that what is being said in Cantonese is probably the kind of most profound part of the film and of the narrative where all the reflection is very, very condensed. And I think, you know, if in my experience of, of having lived here um, and of having kind of learned what Chinese culture is about was from that perspective. Um, so it was essential for me to acknowledge that and also to acknowledge uh, the fact that I experienced certain events here in 2014, um, which also I think what this uh, scholar narrates in the film, I think it's, it's a very different awareness that the, the Cantonese part allows or I give it this kind of special position within the whole structure. Actually, I want to ask something. You know, um, by, you know, of course, making a video, making a film, even though there's narration, uh, you end up focusing on aspects like, as I, I'm going back to my previous point, uh, focusing on structure. Did you give some thought about, because institutions, I think for me, maybe not because I'm in an institution, for me an institution certainly isn't just the physical structures, and I'm, I don't even mean the public necessary, there are all these constraints that come from invisible structures or, you know, different challenges that you can talk about, for example, the Norway requiring a Norwegian element or things like that. Uh, how can you portray that? I mean, like, I, I, I mean, you, you portrayed it subtly with the with the curtain. I mean, what were things that you couldn't easily portray in in uh, different experiences that in interactions with institutions or more that kind of structure that it was difficult to portray, portray in your opinion? 
Mm, I think I have to think about this. Um, there were, you know, so many temptations, um, especially you know, around the politics of, well, of being an artist, of where you are an artist, of how much you could affect anything, um, and how much the structures of art affect you. So I'm not sure if, you know, if I ever kind of arrived at that moment um, of not being able to find a way of articulating something. And also, I, you know, I recognize my own limitations and also the limitations of um, film as a language. So many things happen in, in this film that uh, rely on, uh, I guess, a, a number of contradictions as well. And I think that's so interesting for me, having lived um, in Hong Kong and also having left Hong Kong to, to go back and uh, practice, continue my practice in London, is that you know London also has many contradictions. Um, but they are more familiar to me. And I think, you know, here I probably did everything I could to understand, you know, how would it be possible for someone like me to continue my practice. But I probably wouldn't find an appropriate language for practicing here. I, I guess I'm already, you know, quite, um, I've been practicing for many, many years under such different conditions that I just wouldn't know uh, how to do it. I mean, and, and also, you know, give, going back to, to this idea that, you know, I grew up in a, in a system where everything was expressed through a code and you know, I guess I maybe beca became an artist because of that, because you know, making art is a form of coding all the time. And one more thing: I, I, uh, the characters that that um, the two, three, the two women and the one collector are these the results of not just writing, but did you were there was there a long process of interviewing people, interviewing? Who are you interviewing exactly? I mean, uh, uh, because they were a bit too optimistic. I think most people are more cynical than that in, the, in those positions, in China at least. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, but you know, the interviewing was a uh, part of research. So I, I don't necessarily felt that I had to exactly just transcribe those interviews. So I use the interview to gain knowledge and then I would um, rewrite part of it. Although there are two parts that are completely uh, true to the interview. So one is the interview with Dai Zhikang about him uh, making the museum and the other is with Lu Zhe. Um, about his kind of early experience of um, collecting and um, but I turned him into a woman so um, which he was fine with that. But can you illustrate a little bit more about the gender because you, you alluded to it earlier but um. well if you if you um, I, I know you've seen the museum futures and so that previous film is also um, a conversation, but it's more of a interview w between two women. Uh, one is a future museum director of Moderna Muset, and the other is a journalist based in Guangzhou. Uh, so already then, so I guess that's 2058, um, most museum directors would be women. Um, they most likely be of uh, mixed race, which was um, the case in, in the other film. So I think, you know, this is my belief um, that these places will be run by women uh, and that the conditions 
are that I guess I'm building through the film uh, are the conditions for for women to to be uh, running these institutions. Yeah, I mean the the gender issue is important. Thank you for the film. I, I enjoyed it a lot. I particularly enjoyed uh, the young girl who have to who, who she have to kind of uh, awkwardly recite all these perfectly written uh, lines that that makes the film futuristic. Yeah, so so it's interesting to to watch that. It's like it's not the it's not the China now. Is a is a possible China uh, uh, China in the future somewhere, and then the the scenes uh, pointing uh, urban landscape through the through the cloth that totally was like the oracle speaking. Yeah, it, that was like that line was so well written that and and then it's almost like yeah your word authoritative figure, but I don't read it that way. Yeah, because the language tone uh, suddenly changed to Cantonese in that, and it happened t twice. So, so, so then it, so it puts the the time of the film almost like fifty years from now. Yeah, that's how that's how I read it. The final point is the about the Yuan Ming Yuan, uh, the the garden that was destroyed. It is it's actually Italian garden with uh, Italian architect and then. Uh, that came to China back then, in the Qing Dynasty, to build it, and then it was destroyed. And then, the uh, many years later, the artists moved in to build their artist community. I see that as a parallel to, to the adaptation of the museum right now. And 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 the destruction of that, the the kind of Western exterior form, and then it will be destroyed. And then, it, and, and then the ruin happens. It is the ruin that makes sense and become lively, just like those artist village outside of uh, near but near the imperial palace, as well as those near the airport. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a quick question. Don't know if this was addressed here. Um, did you, when you were making this at all, were you in touch with Taupe with when she was making Prison Architect about the Tycoon, which was the film about they basically imagining this space as a prison museum? I don't know if that affected what you were doing at all. Okay, I kept thinking of that as we were watching this film. Um, we saw it here earlier this year. And my other question is when you were dealing with the two actresses, so you said you didn't coach them in terms of uh, having a particular personality that they were supposed to project, because they were so different. It was amazing to see how they were really diametrically opposed in their mannerism. What I was looking for two very different women and uh, I didn't have a huge choice, so I was auditioning on Skype. Um, you know, I was in London and I had to make a commitment to someone and then fly to Shanghai and uh, film it. So I guess it was just uh, an intuitive choice and just a choice from, you know, six people that were at the time available for the amount of money that I had to offer, which was very little. Um, and my coaching, I think they were very impatient. And I found, uh, you know, that's a whole different story. My experience of the production team of making something like this in, well, relatively short time of three weeks. Um, I mean, the film was made, you know, I took probably two years to make it, but uh, that uh, segment of recording the, convers the, the conversation between women um, was three weeks, uh, was, you know, I learned so much about everything that no one could prepare me for. 
And one of those things is really work ethic. I was unprepared for people just simply not paying any attention to what was in front of them and what they were doing. So, you know, this was a, a huge struggle and I almost gave up. I was so, um, yeah, just mentally challenged and emotionally challenged. Um, yeah, being with five young, incredibly intelligent um, Chinese, Shanghangese um, people who just c really couldn't give a damn what was happening. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a bit of a miracle that I did manage to, to get something out of them. But that sense of alienation is some, was something that you were looking for as well, right? Maybe. Well, maybe <laughs> not originally. I, I just had to, in a way, you know, this is sometimes things present themselves to you and you have to make the most out of them. Uh, what, what, you know, the material that I had, so much of the recording was such bad quality that a lot of the dialogue just had to be re arranged to for us to be able to edit it into you know some kind of coherent um, yeah conversation so you know the technical the human limitations the physical limitations the material limitations it's all there um, and you know maybe that's okay it's it's not a lavish production. It's a sort of homemade um, proposition, so that's all I could do. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, uh, because Hong Kong is in kind of a unique situation where there's kind of a blending of like the British and the Chinese, and now that after the handover has happened, it's kind of returning more to a Chinese, like, um, I guess, like, environment. And I was wondering how that's going to affect, because um, earlier it was said that um, China is kind of adopting this idea of the museum, whereas, I guess, Hong Kong has had that sort of, like, under, already, like, something that's already happened. Like, they already have their the British sense of Western culture. How do you think that's going to affect the museum moving forward in both China and Hong Kong together. I don't know if that makes much sense, but it's kind of a question for the whole panel, I think. Question to the whole panel. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the brave one? <laughs> well, I can say one thing that, while it's all true what you said, it is, uh, I only came here in the beginning of 2014, um, but it was still incredibly shocking to me that the legacy of the British Empire really left no museums. You know, there is, you know, in Britain, every little place has a museum. Well, not really in Hong Kong. So the British were busy with something else here, not necessarily particularly uh, with you know, building that aspect of, or pay, paying attention to that aspect of the culture, whether their own or uh, the people who, were, who they've encountered here. So you know, this is something I am still incredibly puzzled by. Um, and also, you know, the delay of the M plus um, is something that I, I guess I've been following from its inception. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really not sure where to situate that whole scenario. And I guess we could blame the British. I, I have something to say. <laughs> which is quite general and, and brief. I think we should all do more to defend artistic freedom. Um, artistic freedom is not a particular 
well, no, let me put it that way. We should all do more to defend artistic freedom. Uh, and that we should fight against the particular kind of censorship that pinpoints to particular political uh, positions that you know, that excludes particular political positions. And I think we have a long way to go because in Hong Kong we haven't practiced, we haven't rehearsed enough of how to talk about freedom. And I think we need to explore more and artists um, guide us uh, along the way. And, uh, and it's very important that we let ourselves uh, be guided by artists. Yeah, and I think, yeah, definitely we should defend artistic freedom. In fact, we should defend freedom in general. Um, I, think, I think the other point that I was always kind of thinking of is uh, in thinking about structures and, you know, th invisible structures, is that how, okay, one, you know, when you talk about choices, I mean, all these choices are made in every museum around the world. I mean, these choices are also made before it even appears, right? Uh, or in other words, people, always, someone is always, someone or something or some entity is always backing a museum. They're always, it, always backing a museum, like uh, supporting a museum. Uh, there's always, you know, particular stakeholders involved. Uh, so what I mean is, in what, to what degree are museums irredeemably flawed? In what, if you go back to the commons idea, in what way can this be recuperated, or or is it, or, or is the only ideal solution, you know, museum in ruins? You know, H how 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 would this be, you know, negotiated, and contested or changed? You asking me? Oh, to everyone actually, or to the to the to the general public as well. Okay, well, uh, let the general public. <laughs> Could we have the microphone on the fourth floor, fourth row, please? I'd like to answer your question with a question. That, I mean, that, thank you for your film. Um, one of the things that puzzles me, no end, is that you've said at, in our conversation, in your conversation, that art works are art practice is a, is, is a space for reflection. But in the film, the objects are all fugitive, right? You have the paintings being shipped from Beijing to Hong Kong, which may or may not be true. The sculpture is kind of perched in Bergen, not on display on the way to China. And this idea, I mean, that museums are a place under challenge, but you know, that you, you make these very vexed histories of objects on the way elsewhere in the film, which is, so this is the question to answer your question. I hope it's. I think an extremely interesting observation. I didn't even make that connection. And now that you say that, um, maybe what it points out towards is that while we think of the museum as the probably kind of most stable construct, I am showing that even the museum cannot be, um, I, I guess it's this question of, of being permanent, that nothing is permanent, that everything uh, is subject to conditions. Um, and it's maybe, you know, this question of how we as artists, as cultural producers, as audiences participate, uh, I guess, more consciously in demanding what are these conditions. So, you know, that has been something that I'm very aware because I work in certain ways, but I also think it requires a certain amount of activism and I think you are a very good example of someone who is an academic, um, a curator, an activist. And these are not separate domains because in the end, I mean, going back to the museum is that I still believe that 
you know, there are different kinds of museums because they are accountable to different kinds of um, systems, publics. And yeah, I would like to see that, you know, we make demands upon museums because essentially, I, and that's the question of, of ownership, um, we should feel that ownership of how they're run, what happens in there, why, what it privileges, um, what are the hierarchies, and what, what are the hidden agendas. You know, the museum is a very complex machine, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be somehow feeling that, I guess, as artists, we have something to contribute and not in terms of simply being grateful that a dealer will sell a work to the museum, um, but I think in other ways. And that really requires a very different approach to practice, to each other, to kind of building networks and communities, to publishing, to all those things uh, in order to change this these parameters. Because if you just let the market decide everything, then you might end up with shopping malls and not with the museum. We are running out of time. If there is no burning question, maybe we can wrap it up here and continue the conversation in a more informal way. But just to echo what Marisha was saying, I also believe that the, the real challenge is really to have the stamina to keep the conversation going and to make those demands um, heard or written or distributed in some form. So thank you so much for being here for the conversation and thank you so much for joining us today.